Hello everyone and welcome back. We continue our short lecture series on how to write an ECHOS term paper or master's thesis. Today I will deal with the introduction <clears throat> in more general terms and then the specific thing that I would like to share my thoughts with you on is uh, the relevance, relevance of a topic and research question. We will look at um, the structure of a term paper or master's thesis at the beginning. Again, just as a reminder to make sure that you keep um, in mind what all this is good for and how it fits with all the other components. Um, then briefly on uh, what you need to consider when writing the introduction, then we will deal with this relevance for the rest of this short talk. Okay, just this was my reminder here on the basic structure. Remember this, part one, two, and three, theoretical, empirical, analytical part. We are still in the theoretical part. And um, we are at the introduction, which is the first part of the theoretical part. And we talk about the introduction as such in general terms. And then the uh, point number three here, relevance of RQ, which stands for research question. And the key question, the key sentence, that you should always keep in mind, and you will hear this again and again and again from my side, is who can benefit how or why from knowing the answer to your research question? Okay, now just a few brief remarks on the introduction as such. Um, keep your introductory remarks short and get to the point quickly. Um, Often people start by writing the introduction. And this is this phase of academic writing when you basically sit in front of a, of a blank piece of paper or well, a white screen actually with not much on it. And uh, this is when you kind of feel, oh my God, you know, I have to produce something, right? I have to write so and so many words or sentences and so on. And this is when all this hot air gets produced. And um, well, psychologically, it's not a bad thing. I mean, you need to get started somehow. You should just remember to revisit your introduction after you've finished your term paper or master's thesis or PhD thesis. And then please cut it down, you know. Uh, now you don't feel this urge to write something because you've already written the thesis. So why not reducing this to what it's actually good for? You know the saying that sometimes less is more. It's exactly the case with the introduction. I really don't need to have like pages after pages of, well, basically lots of words, but really, you know, self-evident stuff and, you know, no, trying to get at something in a very complicated way. It's, that's a point where people will actually stop reading, right? Just imagine this is a book and people want to get to the core, to the interesting parts, to the challenging parts, to the questions, and you keep telling them, you know, why China is such a big country and why knowing it is really so important. And then you start, that's the worst thing ever, with a historical overview of something. 95% um, of all topics, it doesn't make sense to do that, but it's something that you learned in another course, so you really want to, to use this knowledge, right? And again, in order to get started, fine, but please cut it out um, after you've finished your thesis, okay? Um, well, a good introduction, frankly, before you reach at the point of, you know, you're stating a research question, half a page, one page is absolutely enough, really. It doesn't have to be much longer. Okay, crucial, another point, um, and I do see students um, omitting this or ignoring this a lot, especially in the introduction, is that you need to provide proof for all claims. Uh, yeah, I know, that is actually normal in academic writing, but sometimes people think the introduction is just the introduction, you know, and I will really start uh, providing all those citations and whatever in the real thesis, so now, you know, I can just write, no, the introduction is part of your thesis, is part of your term paper. So apply the same academic, strict academic standards for citation, quotation, sourcing, as you would do for any other part of that thesis, okay? So provide proof for all claims, even if you sometimes believe they are self-evident. Now, let's not overdo this. Uh, some things are indeed self-evident, but uh, self-evident, but some like the income gap in East Asian societies is widening. Um, that is not self-evident enough 
I think. So that needs to have a source. Um, you can either provide data or you can provide a secondary source like someone who wrote about this as proof this is more than enough. You don't have to discuss this in more depth, but you can't have such a statement standing there without any proof. That is simply impossible. Same goes for this you know, global warming thing that it was uh, recognized as one of the most pressing issues. Well, recognized by whom? Who says so? You know, if you provide a quote from something, can even be a newspaper for God's sake, but don't leave this without um, any proof. Yeah, or many experts agree. This is something that I really dislike because it's this kind of ambiguous thing. Many experts, well, what is many? Who is an expert and who are those many experts? I'd rather like to see that, I don't know, Miller, Smith, and Carpenter agree that, you know, this is uh, much better than saying many experts. And in any case, you need to provide proof again. And a third point I wanted to mention, and I think I will come back to this when we also talk about how to properly cite and reference um, all your sources, is that you need to provide page numbers, um, unless it's not possible to do so. Otherwise, you must. Let's just make this very simple. You must provide page numbers. Um, one exception is websites, because you know websites typically do not have page numbers. Um, which is also why using them as a source is a bit of a problem, in fact. Uh, or if you really refer to the whole source, like if you actually talk about the book, not about an idea from that book, but the book as such. Um, that's, of course, obviously when you do not have provide a page number, but otherwise um, you must provide page numbers. And uh, this applies to all references, not just direct citation. So even if you have this... Um, Many experts agree that you have to provide page numbers or the income gap in East Asian societies is widening, even if that's not a direct quote, but just something that you paraphrase or kind of the essence you get from a number of works, you still have to provide page numbers for that. Okay, so um, please do it. Okay, now relevance, which is the key topic I'd like to talk about today. Uh, there are various terms for relevance. I call it relevance. Um, um, Kate Turabian, for example, calls it the so what question. Um, in any case, it means why you want to answer this particular research question with a focus on particular, right? Uh, that's the most commonly made mistake here, that students very often tell me why they want to talk about the larger topic and kind of forget to discuss the relevance of their actual topic and research question. Um, that's the sentence again, I promised uh, it will show up again and again. So this is another occasion here. Who can ben benefit how and or why from knowing the answer to your research question? Who, what can who be? Well, obviously there are endless opportunities here. Um, I just listed a few examples. This list is not complete, okay? Um, it's just showing you what I actually mean by who. This could be scholars, it could be politicians, it could be companies, NGOs, uh, people who want to save the environment, people who want to improve their performance in something, people who want to avoid something, people who want to achieve something, and so on and so on. So it could be specific people, or it could be groups of people bound together by one common goal, or uh, by one kind of situation they find themselves in, and, and so on. How and why? Um, well, I have a few uh, examples here. You can read that for yourself. Um, and then again, this is just a kind of a, a choice out of a huge number of opportunities, really, obviously, depending on your topic. What's important is that you really state that. Who can benefit and why or how do you think um, they can benefit from knowing the answer to your very specific research question? What's important is that you try to be specific and that you provide proof. Uh, a simple claim, like they will benefit, is not necessarily enough. I would like to see a bit more on that. Um, I mean, it doesn't really have to be go down to data. It would be nice if you have them, of course. But uh, just, you know, every Korean will benefit from that um, because it's important for them. That's not really a good answer why your topic or research question is relevant, right? Um, that's already tells you that in order to determine why your topic and research question is relevant, you actually have to have some previous knowledge. You can't really answer this right at the very beginning. You have to already have a good 
certain understanding of the topic itself. Usually it means you would have read something already um, and uh, you would have thought about the whole thing a lot. Only then will you be able to come up with a good explanation of irrelevance. And, you know, writing is a process and it's, there's nothing wrong in actually returning to this and adding to relevance while you are already working on your empirical part or even on your analytical part or even after you have finished your thesis when it suddenly occurs to you, oh, wow, you know, uh, these people would really benefit, right? Great, go back to this in, part in your introduction and add it. Um, my experience is from reading uh, term papers, master's thesis and PhD thesis as well, is that uh, the longer this explanation of irrelevance is, the uh, less the author seems to know what he or she is actually talking about. Um, so it can be brief, no problem with half a page or a page or something. It doesn't have to be five or 10 pages. Uh, usually people talk a lot when they don't really know what to say. If you know what to say, you can formulate very precisely bam, 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 one argument after the other. As a reader, it's much easier for me if I actually see this, if I don't have to kind of dig for information in between all these words and sentences, you know. Um, so um, try to think it through, come up with a good list of ideas why your topic and uh, research question could be relevant. And you could even provide bullet points if you want. But in any case, I should really see your arguments uh, very clearly. Do not hide them in too much text. If you can't provide these arguments clearly, it usually means that you don't have good arguments. And that means that you have to keep searching. OK, um, oh, good. No hot air, please, as you see here on the slide. A few examples. Um, the latest Samsung smartphone and the latest iPhone are to be compared. Remember, we had a similar example in one of my previous lectures here. So what is this commonly made mistake? And I see this a lot, actually, uh, is that people explain why smartphones are important and great and why, you know, you can use smartphones for anything and why a smartphone is really something that is relevant for you. Yeah, no doubt about it, but that's not your topic, right? You didn't write about the um, the, the uh, utility of smartphones. Your topic is comparing the latest Samsung smartphone and the latest iPhone, right? So, uh, yeah, fine, one sentence on smartphones, okay, I'm happy with this, but then please move on to your actual topic, um, which is in yellow a little better if you explain why and for whom difference be differences between different uh, types of smartphones actually matter, right? Because your topic is a comparison between two types. So uh, that makes sense, but it's not enough. Much better marked in green if you explain why comparing these two particular models makes sense, because that's what you do. You do not compare Android versus iOS. You compare the latest smartphone by Samsung with the latest smartphone by iPhone. So these are two very specific models. So I want to know why you compare those and why do you think who can benefit how from knowing the similarities and differences, right? Um, you provide proof for those claims. Um, you know, this why you think people can benefit, either in the form of facts by citing other authors or by using logic, of course, that's also possible. Another example, example B here would be uh, government policies on shadow education in Japan and South Korea being compared with each other. Again, this typical mistake is you spend two pages on explaining why shadow education matters. I believe you, but that's not your topic. Your topic is not why is shadow education something we need to pay attention to. Your topic is comparing government policies on shadow education in Japan and South Korea. Again, in yellow, you explain compared different systems of shadow education can be useful. You see. What's missing here is government policies, and what's also missing is uh, Japan and South Korea. Therefore, in green, um, it's much better um, focusing on Japan and South Korea, as you promised uh, to do in your topic and research question, and you focus on government policies. Okay, 
I hope I'm repeating myself and I hope I started boring you, which is important. That means that you kind of understood what I tried to tell you. So bottom line is stick to the relevance of your specific topic, okay? Not something that's related or that is kind of um, more abstract, but try to get as close to your specific topic as possible. Now, last time, remember, we talked about finding a good topic and research question, and why not using this as a little exercise to also talk about the relevance, right? This um, sentence um, in uh, italics, that's something from a previous uh, presentation I had on finding a good topic and research question. And I argued that this is not just an academic problem. I told you that uh, this also might matter for companies or campaign managers or something. Perhaps without you noticing, I was at that time trying to convince you that this is relevant, right? Um, and that's what I also talked about in one of my previous presentations, this structure that we talk about right now, and that I force you to follow slavishly point by point in your term papers and master's thesis. This should be the underlying rationale for most of the arguments that you make, even if you would then kind of wrap it up differently, not necessarily identify each component as such, but they should be included because that's what people are looking for, right? You try to convince them to do something and they are much more likely to do it if you tell them why that's useful, okay? So um, take this as an example, who can benefit how or why from knowing what a good topic or research question is? And the first example we already talked about, that's you, right, a student, who needs to write an ECOS term paper or master's thesis. So for this group of people, the student, it's important. And what it's important for? For writing an, a good uh, ECOS term paper or master's thesis. You could be more specific. You could say for writing an ECOS term paper or master's thesis that receives a good grade, right? So this is what I mean by who and why and how. And if you read this, you suddenly understand, okay, that makes sense, right? This is a good argument. Now, is that enough? Not necessarily. You keep thinking, who else could benefit? This is now uh, drawn directly from this italic text. We have the entrepreneur or we have the campaign manager who have uh, to assign tasks to their respective teams to make sure that these people work in the most efficient and effective way so that they uh, reach a particular goal, actually, that has been defined. Don't waste their energy into reaching other goals that might not be, or ob objectives that might not be as um, important as the core objective. That's why it's so important to have a fitting, good, specific research question. People know what to do and uh, they work towards a target that you have specified. Now, actually, those, uh, the second and the third line here, they are pretty similar. They are just taken from different contexts, but it's always about a team leader who needs to instruct his team. That's why the fourth point here is, again, different. That's an employee. That's a member of a team, right? And I think this is also very relevant for you, especially in the future. Um, imagine, you know, there is like 10 of you in a team and your boss comes into the room and says, okay, guys, good morning. Um, that's what we're gonna do for the next two months. I have five tasks here. Um, who wants to do task number one? And then, you know, he shows you a PowerPoint and then you see like five different tasks, which you could also define as topic and research questions. And if you have developed an understanding for what is a good task, perhaps from your own perspective, like a task that is easily understandable, that you can handle more easily, it's a very useful skill. Because then you know, oh, boss, I'm going to do topic number two, while everyone else is still kind of hesitant and wondering, and you know, nobody wants to be first. You see those five topics, you see that mm, one is really very broad in general, I'm going to work my ass off and still will not be able to, re to reach any con conclusive result. Uh, this topic there, that's specific. I already have some previous knowledge on it. Fantastic. I'm going to do it. And this can be excellent for your career. You know, you fulfill your task, you get promoted while everybody else is still kind of trying to um, do what they cannot do because they don't have the necessary knowledge because they really overextended themselves. They work like 12 hours a day and you're already finished after, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks and, you know, you will be um, the golden boy of your boss. Um, okay. Well, number one, I think this is actually true. It is a useful skill. And secondly, it's what I mean by providing actually a specific 
arguments on why a topic and research question can be of relevance, right? So I hope you are getting my point here. And finally, as usual, the uh, grading according to the standard ACOS form. Uh, out of 72 points, again, you only get two points for relevance of research question. And uh, the same applies like last time when I talked about finding a good topic and research question. It's much more important than those two out of 72 points. The thing is that at the point when you will submit your thesis paper or whatever, you and I, we will have discussed this. And when you send me your theoretical part or your ideas on what to write, I will ask you, okay, where do you see the relevance? Or I will look for it if you already submitted it to me. And I will clearly comment back to you and saying, look, no. Um, I see that you worked hard and you tried hard to explain the relevance, but I'm not yet convinced. Remember, and then I will repeat that sentence. Who can benefit how or why from you know, answering that specific research question? And then I will send it back to you. And uh, that's why usually once I receive the finished product for grading, um, this issue has already been resolved. And that's why you get only two points for it. Again, it's more like a present from me to you and not something that I would actually grade. Well, there are those exceptions of students who um, choose uh, not to consult me or who choose to ignore um, my ideas, which is perfectly fine, by the way. Um, this is a free world and nobody says that I have all this superior knowledge, you know. Um, actually, you can write an excellent term paper even without me or me doubting that you're able to do so. Uh, that has happened in the past quite a lot, so it made me a bit more humble, actually. Um, I have very often been really, really impressed by the achievements of my students, especially since in some cases I didn't really see it coming. So um, anyway, but that's, that's up to you, right? That's your decision. I'm just trying to explain to you how I see things, how I grade things, to make the whole thing much more transparent for you. And um, yeah, so two points for relevance of research question. Well, that was it um, for this topic, a very important one. I hope you um, understand now better what I expect from you. And I also think that this is one of these skills that can be useful way beyond um, simply a term paper or a master's thesis. So I think it's worth your time and uh, worth your effort to really understand what this is all about. So for now, thank you again for your attention. And I'm looking forward to seeing you for another of our short lectures on how to write an ECHOS term paper or master's thesis. Goodbye.